So, so far we've been going through the basic paradigm or the central dogma of molecular biology, which is essentially means that DNA is replicated into itself, and then it's transcribed into RNA and then translated into proteins. So we're at the point of uh, looking at proteins. Now, proteins are actually long polymers of repeating units, which we call amino acids. And we know that there are 20 essential amino acids that are put together. And so when you put them together, they are um, uh, condensed by the removal of water, dehydration. And this causes a bond to form between the amino acids, which is called a peptide bond. And so long chains of amino acids would then be called polypeptides. Now, all amino acids basically look the same. So if you look at one single amino acid, let's just go say this one right here. Basically, it has a uh, carbon with a double bond to an oxygen and a nitrogen to a single bond to a hydrogen. And uh, those are going to be the uh, two reactive ends. So you have a NH2 over here, and then you have a carbon with an O and an OH over here. And those come together by the removal of water to form this guy right in between, which is, oh, that's a fancy color which is basically a peptide bond. So I'll go ahead and just draw it one more time so you can really see it here. Let's bring in a blank page in here. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and draw two basic uh, amino acids. And let's go ahead and see if we can hook them together. So we have a carbon here, which has a hydrogen over here. And then one of the ends is going to be an NH2, like so. And the other end over here is going to be a carbon, which is double bonded to oxygen, and then OH over here. And then you have an interesting thing over here. This is the letter R. R is a variable, and it could be any 20 of things to make the 20 different amino acids. So let's suppose, let's bring another amino acid. I'm going to go ahead and draw a different color here, just so you can really understand what I'm talking about. So let's bring uh, NH2 over here and C. And let's bring it in up here. Another one. Sorry, this is taking so long here. And H over here and R. So we're going to do condensation, which is the removal of water here. So where can we find water in those two molecules? Well, let's see. Why don't we take uh, OH out of here. And we'll take uh, H over here. So that would be, let's bring it out of here. That would be water would come out, right? And then these two guys would come together. So let's bring our eraser in here. This goes away. And we take away one of the H's there. And then you could go ahead and bring together a bond. And that would be called a peptide bond. So I just made a dipeptide here. Two amino acids hooked together. Okay. If you string together a whole bunch of amino acids, that's what we're going to call the primary structure. But there's all sorts of amino acids. Some of them are ionic, some of them are hydrophobic, some of them are hydrophilic. They have all sorts of properties. And some of them really like each other, and some of them really hate each other. And sometimes, if they like each other so much, they actually form bonds with each other. So here, for example, are two amino acids that form a bond. Here we go. Here's other bonds. There's two different ways that they could form bonds. One of the ways actually takes the primary structure. So remember, we just had a chain like this. And it then forms bonds, and it creates kind of a familiar structure. Remember this guy? That's a helix. So this guy here, this structure, is actually called an alpha helix, right? It's just one of the interesting structures. Now, another way bonds could form between amino acids is they could come across here. So we have two parallel kind of primary chains here. They form bonds between each other and this shape here is called a beta sheet or a beta pleated sheet. So we started with the primary structure which is amino acids. We then form intermolecular bonds and we get two new secondary structures which could be an alpha helix or a beta sheet. Okay, so why is this happening? Because of the properties of amino acids. Some are nonpolar, some are polar, all sorts of things, and then we get bonds forming between them. 
What are bonds that could form? Well, you could have hydrophobic bonds, for example. Those could form between amino acids that are both nonpolar, and so they come together like two fatty molecules would come together. You could have two amino acids that both have sulfur in them, and those form disulfide bridges. So, for example, cysteine is an amino acid that has sulfur in it. Or you could have negative and positive, and they attract. So those amino acids would come together to form ionic bonds. There's other bonds like hydrophilic bonds and hydrogen bonds and so forth. But these are good examples of reasons why amino acids in a primary structure would come together to form a secondary structure. Okay, so here we see a picture. This is the primary structure, the polypeptide chain of amino acids. And then because of the properties of the amino acids, various bonds, right, start to form between them like this. And that will deform the primary structure and change it to give it a secondary structure. Then we go up to a tertiary structure. So, tertiary structures, once you've got these interesting shapes, they can then, then fold into each other to form a three-dimensional shape. So this is very three-dimensional, right? That's what we call a tertiary structure. So it folds within itself. And once things get a three-dimensional shape, then it gets all sorts of properties, like enzymes had active sites. That was a shape-dependent idea based on the lock and key model. Now, if you take a whole bunch of these folded-up things and bring them together, like so, that's when we get what we call a quaternary structure. That is a linking of several three-dimensional polypeptides. Okay. What are the functions then of these proteins once they gain these three-dimensional shapes? Well, there's two types of proteins. You got these long, narrow, water-insoluble proteins, which are called fibrous proteins, right? So what was a really good example of fibrous proteins? Remember those channel proteins in the membranes that allow molecules to pass in and out through the phospholipid structure? Great example of a fibrous protein. And then you also had globular proteins. They're round and water-soluble. What's a really good example of that? Most of your enzymes, right? They're uh, round, they're globular, they have those funny Pac-Man shapes where they have the active sites. What are the functions then of these? Well, there's four basic functions, right? You got structural, that is uh, proteins that hold things together. A great example of that is collagen. Our bodies are filled with collagen, you mash them all up. It's basically kind of what jello is. When we did the uh, gel electrophoresis, that agarose was basically a collagen type molecule. Then you have things which transport other molecules. Hemoglobin is the classic example. Great example, by the way, of quaternary structure. Hemoglobin carries oxygen throughout the blood. Then we have proteins which are involved in movement. Good example of that is myosin. Myosin is the major protein which makes up muscle. And then we have defense. Not sure I spelt that right. Never know if it's a C or E. And uh, good examples of other antibodies, which are made of proteins called immunoglobulins. And that concludes my introduction to proteins.